This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. The Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy. Book Six After Courses. One. The Inevitable Moment Onward. The story of the deaths of Eustatia and Wild Eve was told throughout Egdon and far beyond for many weeks and months. All the known incidents of their love were enlarged, distorted, touched up, and modified, till the original reality bore but a slight resemblance to the counterfeit presentation by surrounding tongues. Yet, upon the whole, neither the man nor the woman lost dignity by sudden death. Misfortune had struck them gracefully, cutting off their erratic histories with a catastrophic dash, instead of, as with many, attenuating each life to an uninteresting meagreness, through long years of wrinkles, neglect, and decay. On those most nearly concerned the effect was somewhat different. Strangers who had heard of many such cases now merely heard of one more, but immediately where a blow falls, no previous imaginings amount to appreciable preparation for it. The very suddenness of her bereavement dulled, to some extent, Thomason's feelings. Yet irrationally enough, a consciousness that the husband she had lost ought to have been better did not lessen her mourning at all. On the contrary, this fact seemed at first to set off the dead husband in his young wife's eyes and to be the necessary cloud to the rainbow. But the horrors of the unknown had passed. Vague misgivings about her future as a deserted wife were at an end. The worst had once been matter of trembling conjecture. It was now matter of reason only, a limited badness. Her chief interest, the little Eustatia, still remained. There was humility in her grief no defiance in her attitude, and when this is the case, a shaken spirit is apt to be stilled. Could Thomason's mournfulness now, and Eustatia's serenity during life, have been reduced to common measure, they would have touched the same mark nearly. But Thomason's former brightness made shadow of which in a sombre atmosphere was light itself. The spring came and calmed her, the summer came and soothed her, the autumn arrived and she began to be comforted, for her little girl was strong and happy, growing in size and knowledge every day. Outward events flattered Thomason not a little. Wild Eve had died intestate, and she and the child were his only relatives. When administration had been granted, all the debts paid, and the residue of her husband's uncle's property had come into her hands, it was found that the sum waiting to be invested for her own and the child's benefit was little less than ten thousand pounds. Where should she live? The obvious place was Bloom's End. The old rooms, it is true, were not much higher than the between-decks of a frigate, necessitating a sinking in the floor under the new clock-case she brought from the inn and the removal of the handsome brass knobs on its head, before there was height for it to stand. But, such as the rooms were, there were plenty of them, and the place was endeared to her by every early recollection. Klim very gladly admitted her as a tenant, confining his own existence to two rooms at the top of the back staircase, where he lived on quietly, shut off from Thomasin and the three servants she had thought fit to indulge in now that she was a mistress of money, going his own ways and thinking his own thoughts. His sorrows had made some change in his outward appearance, and yet the alteration was chiefly within. It might have been said that he had a wrinkled mind. He had no enemies, and he could get nobody to reproach him which was why he so bitterly reproached himself. He did sometimes think he had been ill-used by fortune, so far as to say that to be born 
is a palpable dilemma, and that instead of men aiming to advance in life with glory, they should calculate how to retreat out of it without shame. But that he and his had been sarcastically and pitilessly handled in having such irons thrust to their souls, he did not maintain long. It is usually so, except with the sternest of men. Human beings, in their generous endeavour to construct a hypothesis that shall not degrade a first cause, have always hesitated to conceive a dominant power of lower moral quality than their own, and, even while they sit down and weep by the waters of Babylon, invent excuses for the oppression which prompts their tears. Thus, though words of solace were vainly uttered in his presence, he found relief in a direction of his own choosing when left to himself. For a man of his habits, the house and the hundred and twenty pounds a year which he had inherited from his mother were enough to supply all worldly needs. Resources do not depend upon gross amounts, but upon the proportion of spendings to takings. He frequently walked the heath alone, when the past seized upon him with its shadowy hand, and held him there to listen to its tale. His imagination would then people the spot with its ancient inhabitants. Forgotten Celtic tribes trod their tracks about him, and he could almost live among them, look in their faces, and see them standing beside the barrows which swelled round, untouched and perfect, as at the time of their erection. Those of the dyed barbarians who had chosen the cultivable tracts were, in comparison with those who had left their marks here, as writers on paper besides writers on parchment. Their records had perished long ago by the plough, while the works of these remained. Yet they all had lived and died unconscious of the different fates awaiting their relics. It reminded him that unforeseen factors operate in the evolution of immortality. Winter again came round, with its winds, frosts, tame robins, and sparkling starlight. The year previous, Thomason had hardly been conscious of the season's advance. This year she laid her heart open to external influences of every kind. The life of this sweet cousin, her baby and her servants, came to Klim's senses only in the form of sounds through a wood partition, as he sat over books of exceptionally large type. But his ear became at last so accustomed to these slight noises from the other part of the house, that he almost could witness the scenes they signified. A faint beat of half-seconds conjured up Thomason rocking the cradle. A wavering hum meant that she was singing the baby to sleep. A crunching of sand, as between millstones, raised the picture of Humphreys, Fairways, or Sam's heavy feet crossing the stone floor of the kitchen. A light boyish step, and a gay tune in a high key, betokened a visit from Granfer Cantle. A sudden break-off in the Granfer's utterances implied the application to his lips of a mug of small beer. A bustling and slamming of doors meant starting to go to market. For Thomason, in spite of her added scope of gentility, led a ludicrously narrow life, to the end that she might save every possible pound for her little daughter. One summer day Klim was in the garden, immediately outside the parlour window, which was as usual open. He was looking at the pot-flowers on the sill. They had been revived and restored by Thomason to the state in which his mother had left them. He heard a slight scream from Thomason, who was sitting inside the room. "'Oh, you frightened me!' she said to someone who had entered. "'I thought you were the ghost of yourself.' Klim was curious enough to advance a little further and look in at the window. To his astonishment there stood within the room Diggory Venn, no longer a Redelman, but exhibiting the strangely altered hues of an ordinary Christian countenance, white shirt-front, light-flowered waistcoat, blue-spotted neckerchief, and bottle-green coat. Nothing in this appearance was at all singular but the fact of its great difference from what he had formerly been. 
Red, and all approach to red, was carefully excluded from every article of clothes upon him. For what is there that persons just out of harness dread so much as reminders of the trade which has enriched them? Yobright went round to the door and entered. "'I was so alarmed,' said Thomason, smiling from one to the other. "'I couldn't believe that he had got white of his own accord. "'It seemed supernatural. "'I gave up dealing in Reddle last Christmas,' said Venn. "'It was a profitable trade, and I found that by that time "'I had made enough to take the dairy of fifty cows "'that my father had in his lifetime. "'I always thought of getting to that place again, if I changed at all, "'and now I am there.' "'How did you manage to become white, Diggory?' Thomason asked. "'I turned so by degrees, ma'am.' "'He looked much better than ever you did before.' Venn appeared confused, and Thomason, seeing how inadvertently she had spoken to a man who might possibly have tender feelings for her still, blushed a little. Klim saw nothing of this, and added good-humouredly, "'What shall we have to frighten Thomason's baby with, now you have become a human being again?' "'Sit down, Diggory,' said Thomason, "'and stay to tea.' Venn moved as if he would retire to the kitchen, when Thomason said with pleasant pertness, as she went on with some sewing, "'Of course you must sit down here. And where does your fifty-cow dairy lie, Mr. Venn?' "'At Stickleford.' "'About two miles to the right of Alderworth, ma'am, where the meads begin. "'I have thought that if Mr. Yobright would like to pay me a visit sometimes, "'he shouldn't stay away for want of asking. "'I'll not bide to tea this afternoon, thank ye, "'for I've got something on hand that must be settled. "'Tis Maypole Day to-morrow, and the Shadwater folk "'have clubbed with a few of your neighbours here "'to have a pole just outside your palings in the heath, "'as it is a nice green place.' Venn waved his elbow towards the patch in front of the house. "'I have been talking to Fairway about it,' he continued. "'And I said to him that before we put up the pole "'it would be as well to ask Mrs. Waldeve. "'I can say nothing against it,' she answered. "'Our property does not reach an inch further than the white palings. "'But you might not like to see a lot of folk going crazy round a stick "'under your very nose?' I shall have no objection at all. Venn soon after went away, and in the evening Yobright strolled as far as Fairway's cottage. It was a lovely May sunset, and the birch trees, which grew on this margin of the vast Egdon wilderness, had put on their new leaves, delicate as butterflies' wings, and diaphanous as amber. Beside Fairway's dwelling was an open space recessed from the road, and here were now collected all the young people from within a radius of a couple of miles. The pole lay with one end supported on a trestle, and women were engaged in wreathing it from top downwards with wild flowers. The instincts of merry England lingered on here with exceptional vitality, and the symbolic customs which tradition has attached to each season of the year were yet a reality on Egdon. Indeed, the impulses of all such outlandish hamlets are pagan still. In these spots, homage to nature, self-adoration, frantic gaieties, fragments of Teutonic rites to divinities whose names are forgotten, seem in some way or other to have survived medieval doctrine. Yobright did not interrupt the preparations, and went home again. The next morning... When Thomason withdrew the curtains of her bedroom window, there stood the maypole in the middle of the green, its top cutting into the sky. It had sprung up in the night, or rather early morning, like Jack's beanstalk. She opened the casement to get a better view of the garlands and posies that adorned it. The sweet perfume of the flowers had already spread into the surrounding air, which, being free from every taint, conducted to her lips a full measure of the fragrance received from the spire of blossom in its midst. At the top of the pole were crossed hoops decked with small flowers, 
Beneath these came a milk-white zone of maybloom, then a zone of bluebells, then of cowslips, then of lilacs, then of ragged robins, daffodils, and so on, till the lowest stage was reached. Thomasin noticed all these, and was delighted that the May revel was to be so near. When afternoon came, people began to gather on the green, and Yeobright was interested enough to look out upon them from the open window of his room. Soon after this, Thomasin walked out from the door immediately below, and turned her eyes up to her cousin's face. She was dressed more gaily than Yeobright had ever seen her dressed since the time of Wild Eve's death, eighteen months before. Since the day of her marriage, even, she had not exhibited herself to such advantage. "'How pretty you look to-day, Thomasin,' he said. "'Is it because of the maypole?' "'Not altogether.' And then she blushed and dropped her eyes, which he did not specially observe, though her manner seemed to him to be rather peculiar, considering that she was only addressing himself. Could it be possible that she had put on her summer clothes to please him? He recalled her conduct towards him throughout the last few weeks, when they had often been working together in the garden, just as they had formerly done when they were boy and girl under his mother's eye. What if her interest in him were not so entirely that of a relative as it had formerly been? To Yeobright any possibility of this sort was a serious matter, and he almost felt troubled at the thought of it. Every pulse of lover-like feeling which had not been stilled during Eustatia's lifetime had gone into the grave with her. His passion for her had occurred too far on in his manhood to leave fuel enough on hand for another fire of that sort, as may happen with more boyish loves. Even supposing him capable of loving again, that love would be a plant of slow and laboured growth, and in the end only small and sickly, like an autumn-hatched bird. He was so distressed by this new complexity that when the enthusiastic brass band arrived and struck up, which it did about five o'clock, with apparently wind enough among its members to blow down his house, he withdrew from his rooms by the back door, went down the garden, through the gate in the hedge, and away out of sight. He could not bear to remain in the presence of enjoyment to-day, though he had tried hard. Nothing was seen of him for four hours. When he came back by the same path, it was dusk, and the dews were coating every green thing. The boisterous music had ceased, but entering the premises as he did from behind, he could not see if the May party had all gone, till he had passed through Thomason's division of the house to the front door. Thomason was standing within the porch, alone. She looked at him reproachfully. "'You went away just when it began, Clem,' she said. "'Yes, I felt I could not join in. "'You went out with them, of course?' "'No, I did not. "'You appeared to be dressed on purpose.' "'Yes, but I could not go out alone. "'So many people were there. "'One is there now.' "'Yeobright strained his eyes across the dark green patch.' beyond the paling, and near the black form of the maypole he discerned a shadowy figure, sauntering idly up and down. "'Who is it?' he said. "'Mr. Venn,' said Thomasin. "'You might have asked him to come in, I think, Tamsie. He has been very kind to you, first and last.' "'I will now,' she said, and acting on the impulse, went through the wicket to where Venn stood under the maypole, "'It is Mr. Venn, I think?' she inquired. Venn started as if he had not seen her, artful man that he was, and said, "'Yes.' "'Will you come in?' "'I am afraid that I—' "'I have seen you dancing this evening, and you had the very best of the girls for your partners. Is it that you won't come in because you wish to stand here, and think over the past few hours of enjoyment?' "'Well—' "'That's partly it,' said Mr. Venn, with ostentatious sentiment. 
but the main reason why I am biding here, like this, is that I want to wait till the moon rises. To see how pretty the maypole looks in the moonlight? No. To look for a glove that was dropped by one of the maidens. Thomason was speechless with surprise. That a man who had to walk some four or five miles to his home should wait here for such a reason pointed to only one conclusion. The man must be amazingly interested in that glove's owner. "'Were you dancing with her, Diggory?' she asked, in a voice which revealed that he had made himself considerably more interesting to her by this disclosure. "'No,' he sighed. "'And you will not come in, then?' "'Not to-night, thank you, ma'am.' "'Shall I lend you a lantern to look for the young person's glove, Mr. Venn?' "'Oh, no, it is not necessary, Mrs. Wildeve, thank you. "'The moon will rise in a few minutes.' "'Thomason went back to the porch. "'Is he coming in?' said Klim, who had been waiting where she had left him. "'He would rather not to-night,' she said, and then passed by him into the house whereupon Klim, too, retired to his own rooms. When Klim was gone, Thomasin crept upstairs in the dark, and, just listening by the cot to assure herself that the child was asleep, she went to the window, gently lifted the corner of the white curtain, and looked out. Ven was still there. She watched the growth of the faint radiance appearing in the sky by the eastern hill, till presently the edge of the moon burst upwards and flooded the valley with light. Diggory's form was now distinct on the green. He was moving about in a bowed attitude, evidently scanning the grass for the precious missing article, walking in zigzags right and left, till he should have passed over every foot of the ground. "'How very ridiculous!' Thomason murmured to herself, in a tone which was intended to be satirical. To think that a man should be so silly as to go mooning about like that for a girl's glove. A respectable dairyman, too, and a man of money as he is now. What a pity! At last Venn appeared to find it, whereupon he stood up and raised it to his lips. Then, placing it in his breast-pocket, the nearest receptacle to a man's heart permitted by modern raiment, he ascended the valley in a mathematically direct line towards his distant home in the meadows. End of Book Six One Recorded by Gesine in Valletta, May 2006